for nuclear manager leadership responsibilities. During David's presentation, he had talked about a typical commercial nuclear power plant requires anywhere from 600 to 800 employees. Well, how do you get that information to the workforce such that everyone knows how to move forward? One of the exercises that we will do is what I call a paper exercise. If you don't have uh, a blank sheet of paper, feel free to take a sheet and just pass it on. This will be about the middle of the presentation. One of the things that I would also like to comment on that David brought up, uh, he being a radio chemist, and I started off my career uh, as a radio chemist and eventually uh, pursued a degree in health physics or the radiation sciences. From there, I progressed into industrial safety uh, in the power plant environments. And from there, I was even able to expand my background even more by getting involved with quality assurance and also emergency operations. So the nuclear industry, uh, should you want to stay in the industry, it does provide a variety of opportunities, a variety of areas that you can even what I call subspecialize in. Uh, typically, for the most part, everyone has some form of technical degree. But once again, you will find yourself as you go through your career, if you haven't discovered this already, that you will begin to specialize in a certain area. But it's also good to have a variety of experiences in other fields. Because when you find yourself as a department manager, the key item there is to make sure or knowing who to bring in, who to talk to. And that's one of the things that we'll cover uh, in this presentation. So by participating in this course, what my goal is to prepare you for that transition. Some of you may already find yourself uh, serving as a department manager. Others may still be uh, working within your organization uh, at a certain level where you're focused on technical information, not necessarily a manager, maybe a technical lead. But uh, as I show here, uh, the information that I'm providing, uh, hopefully this will prepare you to become a visionary leader and efficient manager. There are two distinct attributes. Uh, I have also been fortunate to teach at the university level. I taught for a number of years at the University of New Mexico. I team taught uh, with a professor, and I also taught at one of our local trade schools that uh, David had also mentioned. Uh, the trade school specialized in training uh, chemical operators that were actually working at the nearby chemical plants. And we used a lot of the same information that we would train our nuclear operators working at the various nuclear facilities in the area. So the, the interesting thing about technical information, and once you get in the nuclear industry, as well as any other type of process or energy industry, the information uh, is interchangeable. Granted, there are distinctions because you're dealing with nuclear materials. But uh, as David had mentioned, many of the industrial processes are the same. So the learning objectives, uh, recognizing the need for a class on management, and ultimately leadership, why are we all here? Uh, the study of management, this has been going on for quite some time. And uh, so I have some historical aspects uh, to show with that. Uh, learning objective number three, when you finally find yourself in charge, the manager leader mystique of success. Uh, item number four, how to turn these ideas into actual performance, what you can do or uh, tools that you can use to become an effective manager. Uh, nuclear managerial leadership, career advice, what I have learned. I've worked in the industry, uh, in the nuclear industry, both in the government sector and the uh, commercial power energy sector for about 28 years. And I'm, I'm always happy to share my experiences to help those students uh, that are up and coming in their careers. And then last but not least, uh, item number six, additional handouts and slides, just because of the time factor, uh, I have my segment of slides that I'll provide. Uh, in it, depending upon how you can download this material, which I understand you're, you're supposed to be able to, there are additional slides in the back that you can refer to your, uh, at your leisure. And then there are also handouts that I provided in ASHOC. Are those, were those handouts or will those be accessible as well? 
So, okay. And there's a list. I have a slide which shows the various list of handouts that you can use, and, and I'll cover those at the very end. So recognizing the need for class on management and ultimately the leadership. Now, as I mentioned, when you start off your career, you're typically covering uh, or responsible for technical information. You may be working on your own on a specific project, maybe on a team, but you may find yourself actually reporting what I call up the chain or up the, the chain of command in the organization to some other manager or director. But for the most part, you're the manager of the data. You're providing a technical specialty. For example, electrical engineering, right? Okay, you might be the only electrical engineer, but you're working with a team of mechanical engineers and maybe some other process engineers, but you're bringing that technical specialty uh, to the group. Uh, and as I mentioned, reporting to the manager. And some of the terms, as you go through the literature, you may see this term being used, SME, subject matter expert. And all that is is just referring to that you, you provide a specific technical specialty. Now, for those of you that, that do have uh, an engineering degree, uh, you may be familiar with this engineering flowchart. Does it move? If not, should it? If no, then there's no problem. If yes, then you may have to, to spray something on it to get it to move. Uh, does it move? Yes. Should it? If it's supposed to move, then there's no problem. But if you need it to stop, then you apply duct tape. So this is where you typically find yourself at the beginning of your career. Once again, just to uh, review the fact that you're, you're working uh, with a specific, uh, in a specific area, providing a specific specialty. Now you're going from this SME to becoming a department manager. As you gain additional experience, you may finally find yourself responsible for manager of people. And with that responsibility, you are now influencing direct report employees. And here's another uh, common term. Direct report would be those people within your department that report up the chain directly to you. And then you also have other employees outside your organization and company. Those are typically referred to as indirect reports. Like you could be in electrical engineering, and there might be another engineering department that they may not report to you, but you may uh, interact with mechanical engineers. Uh, for example. And one of the things about being a manager, and I use this quote here, anyone can steer a ship when the sea is calm, which means when everything is going well, being a department manager is, is the best job. Because basically you have, you, you're working as a team, you have other people uh, working for you. But often, the critical part of becoming a manager is when there are issues. Uh, there were a number of human resource aspects that David covered in his presentation. Human resources could be one thing, personnel issues. And there's also the technical issues. The technical issues can usually be solved uh, rather straightforward. You know, that you have various ways of, of solving a technical problem. But the human resource issues, hiring, retention, a lot of the terms that David used during his presentation, well, how do you make all that happen? How do you retain employees? So the question here I have, how and when do you discover that you are a manager? Are you appointed as a manager or just suddenly through attrition, through someone above you retiring or leaving the project, are you suddenly promoted uh, to being a manager? And I'd like to just find out from the room, are there people here that are currently identified as managers within your organization? OK. We have two, three, OK. So everyone eventually may find yourself as a manager. How do you like being a manager? So <laughs> it's, it's what? So they assigned you as one. Well. Oh, how many people do you have in your group? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Movement going on. Okay. So, how do you train to become a nuclear manager? Uh, some of the examples that I provided 
as well as possibly some of the managers that I look to in the room, uh, unless a company has a specific training program, once again, here we go back to employee training. Does the employee have a training program to develop you as a manager? For the most part, when I became a manager, I was in a similar situation. I was appointed as a manager, and I was basically learning on the job. And the way I developed my managerial techniques is, as shown here, good and bad styles are obtained and nurtured by watching and working under other good and bad managers. Fortunately, in my career, because I've been able to advance, because I've been able to work in a variety of areas, I feel I have always had very good managers that took an interest in my career and uh, helped me advance uh, in my profession. So based on that model, uh, I have used that when I have become a manager. And for the most part, what I then try to do with the employees working for me is to help uh, those employees advance in their career. I'm happy to say that in my career, I've had about 10 employees that have gone on to manage their own programs, not just in the nuclear field, but in other fields, health and safety, for example. And the other nice thing about that is, is we all still stay in touch, so we can also exchange information. So there is a value of, even though you have an employee that may leave, but fortunately for good circumstances, if they want to advance, and that's the other thing that, that David talked about, retention, human resources issues, employees that are advancing in their career, are there opportunities? Maybe they're leaving because the current company that they're with may just not have those opportunities no longer. So uh, to touch on succession planning, this is where you prepare employees to take on these managerial roles. And just based on this survey that I was able to obtain that was published back in 2014, so it's fairly current, uh, it takes about 90 days to evaluate and name a successor. And then they took uh, surveys of various companies. Do they have someone that could, if, if the current manager or CEO or leader of the company, if they were to leave, how fast could they replace that position? Or would there be anyone available for these positions? And as it shows here, uh, they have very few candidates. 39% reported zero, 32, one, and then 24 provided maybe two. But this is not something that happens. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't happen very quickly. So here we go into the study of management. This has been going on for quite some time. And that's the interesting thing. Management and leadership, it's, it's an interesting area. It's been studied a lot, but we seem to keep having recurring problems. So going back to 1971, and these were taken out of a, uh, a journal article that was actually published in 1983, is that it talks about uh, people are learning from their formal education or their own experience what they most want to know to build successful careers in management. Their failure is due in part to the fact that many crucial managerial tasks are not taught in management education programs. Going to 1977, the graduates lacked a practical, disciplined understanding of themselves and their environment. They didn't know how to use the knowledge effectively. And then even uh, further, from 1982, the business school graduate is adequately trained to get their first job, but difficulty holding it and advancing. So business schools have basically made an industry of studying about management. But as these articles show here, and as what I touched upon in some of the opening slides, there seems to be a disconnect uh, in, in training someone to be a manager. The, the programs just don't seem to be there, or they just don't seem to be as effective. So in this article, the reason why I included this was not only for the historical aspects of management, but they actually identify uh, effective delegation and joint decision making. This is a, a key item here. The other items are typical things that you would cover in, in a business school class. But this particular one talks about delegating and joint decision making. Those are like the two key elements when it comes to being an effective manager. I'd also like to touch upon safety culture and safety climate. This is another area that has been studied for a number of years. Because this is where the, the approach or the, the company environment, the situation that you're in, 
this is where all of this, where, where you're establishing your base. So as we move forward, I wanted to first identify, like, well, how do you know how your organization is working? So here, uh, the distinction is uh, organizational and safety culture, and I have this italicized to, to uh, distinguish this, and then you have organizational and safety climate. If you go through the literature, climate and culture are often used interchangeably. So one of the things that if you're ever reading an article about safety culture, try to find out if the article defines this in the early part of the discussion. Uh, this is based, uh, th this table here is based on my interpretations and my readings of articles on uh, safety culture and safety climate. So organizational safety culture, it's basically quantitative and it's based on perception. Very difficult because you're, you're basing something on what you see or what you, what you think is going on. Whereas safety climate, that's where you're getting into quantitative and numbers, safety statistics. Uh, yesterday, uh, William Fork talked about a number of areas that the NRC monitors, the number of scrams. So you have a number, you can quantify it. Are you above the limit? Are you below the limit? Very straightforward. But once again, when you're trying to evaluate perception, it gets very difficult. And then here, I just talk about how the information uh, and administration is collected, its observations and interviews, patterns of the organization, and often this reflects senior management, so that's another distinction versus when you're getting into safety climate, you're talking to the employee that is what I refer to, they're on the shop floor. One of the things that uh, I off, in my career, I'm still uh, on the shop floor, just as you see me here in a suit, I feel just as comfortable being in coveralls and, and wearing a respirator, of course I would have to shave first, but uh, I've been uh, as I refer to, elbow deep in the 200 liter drum working on stuff, and we even covered one of these things in our root cause analysis. So, uh, but organizational, just to distinguish it, organizational and safety culture, uh, it's a construct of underlying attitudes and practices contributing to the way we do things around here. So that's a way of assessing what your organization is. And then the safety culture, that's resulting uh, perceptions and actions, and it expresses itself through the safety climate, and that would be your survey. So they are somewhat connected. You, you, can, you can take in-house surveys to evaluate your climate, but then it takes a little bit more effort to determine if your culture is, is working, because that's the, the typically the global overview. And as I mentioned here, this is just a list of the various culture and climate studies that have been collected over time, and I wanted to provide this reference here, so if you want to review any of this on your own, go to this reference, and there are a number of uh, culture surveys and climates that you can refer to and uh, review. But as it's shown here, it goes back to the 1930s, but this was more uh, processes leading up to accidents where it's the environment, is it a worker fault, unsafe act plus a hazard, the accident, and then excuse me, finally leading to an injury. You have uh, Turner's theory of man-made disaster in 78, total safety culture model 94, the Swiss cheese model, I did not make that up, 1997. Uh, this is another common term that you may hear, high reliability organization, this came about in 2001, and then Flynn's model of safety climate for the healthcare industry, 2007. This Rona Flynn, I had a chance to meet her uh, it was at a, a conference back about in the early 2000s in University of Aberdeen, and she did a lot of work regarding the, the safety culture on oil rigs. And that's one of the things about n not just the nuclear industry is it's often good to go to other industries uh, to see how they are handling uh, not only their safety culture, but in the emerg emergency planning realm that I work in, we often go to the offshore oil rigs just to see what they're doing and compare it uh, to our programs. So there, there's a tremendous amount of information out there. And then nuclear safety culture, uh, I just have this here as just for reference, that this goes back to the uh, Chernobyl accident uh, from 1986, and this was in the, uh, one of the summaries where it talks about the way to improve is we have to develop a nuclear safety culture. 
And what the IAEA has done, and this is a, a very good reference, uh, once again, if you're not too familiar with this area, this would be a starting point, a very good document to at least read through, and it provides uh, various areas of not only uh, what are the components of a safety culture, but establishing your even your management system. As a department manager, you need to find out who are the people in your department, what are your responsibilities, what is your product, like what are you producing? Are you shipping waste off site? Are you preparing a report? Are you, uh, if you're shipping waste off site, are you dealing with off site regulators? Are you dealing with the uh, facility that receives the, the waste? Or are you dealing with the regulator? Depending upon the environment, uh, this helps uh, define what you may need to do. And this is just the, the second part. There's like 14 chapters that uh, provides useful information. So the case study, uh, and once again, going outside the nuclear industry, because these are always good to go uh, from. And then we also, our, our group, we did a, a root cause analysis. So this is kind of a modified version. Uh, it's often good to go back and look at events that have happened, where management has failed, and where possibly we can make improvements. So there are a lot of case studies that are already out there for you to review and say, well, management or just the facility, you don't necessarily want to. It's, it's not a, a focus of blame. You're not trying to do that. You're trying to learn from the event. So what happened that you can possibly prevent happening from your own site? So a lot of good information that's out there. And this was a, a long for gas production processing plant in Victoria, Austria. There were a number of uh, things that happened. Uh, oil at, at a very high temperature was introduced into a chilled vessel. Uh, there was the temperature difference that called the vessel to, flat, to fracture. There was a rupture to, that released hydrocarbon vapor and the vapor ignited and the oil heaters caused an explosion and fire. And unfortunately, this is what was captured on the evening news from, what I, from uh, the person that provided this information to me. So, uh, unfortunately, when an accident happens, it's too late. So that's really what you're trying to prevent. Not only uh, be able to get your employees, you know, getting them the right information so they can do their work, but also preventing accidents from happening. So here's how we kind of circle back to uh, emergency management. So the Long Ford accident, it was a three-year court case. Uh, the slide here just uh, provides a summary. A summary but the charges, and it identified, it called out what management failed to do, adequate training, hazard analysis, and risk assessment, means to verify the equipment operated at temperatures within design specifications, and operating the plant using adequate procedures. And these are like the three uh, key things as a manager that you need to make sure that you have in place is making sure that you have not only a trained workforce, but procedures. Uh, the presentations, uh, and I understand this, where uh, everything is being presented at a very high level, uh, whereas the benefit or where you really get into the details is where you start developing procedures. There was a discussion about having vendors come in and provide specific services. Typically, uh, and it's probably uh, part of the cost of bringing that vendor on site is that if they're bringing in a special piece of equipment, in my uh, experience, they already have procedures. So it's not that they're bringing in something and now you have to develop the procedure. You basically have to just train from their procedure. So that's the knowledge transfer that's taking place. If you were to develop a procedure, just once again, from my own personal experience, depending upon the complexity of the system, uh, it can take anywhere from 30 to 90 days to develop a procedure because you have to, you possibly have to bring in other personnel, uh, input from, uh, you might be focused on something electrical engineering related, but, you, but there is a mechanical engineering component, so you have to get that person involved. And then once you fast forward, and let's say you're 60 days into it, the procedure is done, then you have to go out and verify that process, just to what the, the term that we use is walk down the process. That way you understand and, and everyone knows that the procedure follows what you're supposed to do in the field. So there's a lot of time and effort that goes into actually implementing a program, so never underestimate that. My rule of thumb is if someone is talking about, well, it's gonna take us 
two weeks to do this, my rule of thumb is I double it, and then I go to the next time scale. So if someone says two weeks, double it, okay, that's four. What's the next time scale? Months. So some, and when someone says it's going to take two weeks, in reality, it may take four months. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind when it comes to estimating and projecting uh, you know, some type of uh, professional action. So this is uh, a root cause analysis. Uh, our group, we had already done a root cause analysis on a different scenario. But once again, this is a useful tool to use to look at to see what happened in other industries and other situations, what can you use and learn from that has already been done and apply it to your own situation. We first start off, it's, it's very high level. It's uh, society impacts uh, that was at the plant, but then there's the government regulatory system and then the company. Um, but for the most part, this is where it, it starts to uh, impact the department manager, the organizational part. And here, where they put everything together, uh, absence of engineers, poor engineering design, supervision, and then all the way down to the physical accident sequence. And as we went through our root cause analysis, one of the things that was done was develop the timeline, kind of talk through the scenario, and then start gathering information. So my group actually went through uh, this particular exercise. So, but this is a, a typical root cause uh, analysis, and uh, this is the version that we used. I know this is very small. I, I did not send this to ASHOC, but what I can do is I can send this so that way the students can access this if they want it. This is a causal tree, and just uh, I'll ask that question. Uh, and I, my group doesn't have to raise their hands because we've already done root cause, but has anybody else, ha have you done a root cause or maybe uh, the, the other term typically used is fact finding? Have you done anything like that before? No, it, it, this is brand new? What? You, okay. So, but uh, for the most part, uh, you know, th this may be something that it's a useful tool uh, to use. So what I came away with was when you look at that root cause analysis, these are the keywords of a bad day. This is what you're trying to prevent as a department manager. Failure occurred five times, poor occurred five times, inadequate loss, absence, alarms, backlog, incorrect, spillover. So there, there's a lot of bad words that, that show up. And this is, once again, as a department manager, this is what you're trying to prevent. So now how do we begin to get control over our program? Uh, and it comes down to four basic questions. And depending upon your situation, you can use this information to step through your process. So uh, what we're doing is, uh, how do you do this work? Hazards and mitigating controls. You have the engineering, administrative, and maybe even some personal protective equipment, such as respiratory protection, and then education and training. So uh, David covered this very extensively in his. So you see where these programs kind of come together. Uh, it comes back to education and training. How do you do this work? You are trained uh, to do a specific work. How do you know that the, this work is being done correctly? Written procedures. That was one of the management failures in the Longford accident. Uh, procedures were not detailed enough, or they, were, they did not even exist. So you have written procedures. You have written guidance. Should there be some form of, uh, if an employee leaves, either through they have another opportunity or just through <clears throat> retirement, the procedure is there for consistent operations. There is value when it comes to procedures. How do you know the outcome is free of defects? Verification and validation. In our root cause analysis, one of the things that the students brought out was that there was no what I or what we call uh, endpoint verification. It turned out it was a chemical reaction. They were neutralizing an acid and they were basing it on adding a, a buffer solution that was supposed to neutralize it but it, it was normally, if this buffer solution was adequate, the color would have changed, but that didn't happen. So normally you would use some type of pH meter to, to verify that this process or that the liquid had been neutralized. But that verification did not happen, and that 
right now we have a contributing cause. We're dis right now the, the mission tonight is to determine whether that could be a, a root cause. So, uh, but I'll, I'll leave that up to you to, to decide. So we have verification validation. How do you know that, uh, that things have come to completion? And what do you do when you discover a deviation and quality assurance corrective action process? If you are in a technical area, if you are in engineering, for example, this is where your quality assurance group comes into play. Another key word that has been used throughout this week has been independence. Quality assurance is, or sh shall be independent of your organizations. This is why you have independent people come in uh, to review uh, the process to check. There's Basically, you're eliminating any form of bias. When we were doing our root cause analysis, one of the things that, uh, that this scenario showed is that we have people that are may maybe familiar or working at the plant site, but they were not involved with the event. They were not involved with the activity. So therefore, you're eliminating that element a bias. You're, you're taking five new people, you're looking at the event brand new for the first time, and you're, you're stepping through. Because if you bring someone in that was involved with the accident, they, they might have their own bias to say that, well, this is the reason why it happened. I did not get along with my supervisor, and he told me to do something I shouldn't have done. That may be true, that may be not, but you need to extract that and see if that statement is valid or not in the root cause analysis. So quality assurance uh, in the nuclear industry, quality uh, assurance is a, a very big deal, a very big issue, and it's typically uh, uh, a standalone group. It doesn't necessarily report to the plant manager. Well, there, there's uh, a, what's called a dotted matrix. It, it's like there's a communication link, but the quality assurance personnel typically reports to maybe a board of director or a vice president that may be in the corporate office off-site. And then if something were to happen, that board of director or that vice president comes to the plant and then seeks corrective action. So uh, that's a, a typical example of independence. And that was talked about a lot from when I was in the back. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah, the, the, the statement that was brought here is, although I, I do have the, the example that I provide is for corrective action, quality assurance is a very large program. There's typically like 18 criteria that I'm familiar with that you step through the organization as being one of them. But it's also the process to make sure you have procedures uh, in place to do the work. And that goes back to the consistency part. Very good, thank you. So when you finally find yourself in charge, okay, we're, we're going to be defining some terms here. Uh, we have manager, leader, and expert. I heard expert being used a lot uh, this week as well, and my conclusion is that an expert really, whoops, 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 let's backtrack. Uh, an expert is just someone who lives about greater than 60 kilometers away from the work site. So that that's, has always been my definition of an expert. When what you're really looking for is a manager and the leader. Now the manager, that's the person responsible for controlling or administering the part of the company or organization. And it's not necessarily a leader. The manager is focused on the here and now. The leader, which once again, th this is often difficult to quantify, the person who leads or commands a group, organization, or country, that's the classic you know, uh, definition that you'd find in a dictionary. Uh, and then this could be the manager. So we're going to focus on manager and leader. Uh, and these are two distinct but complementary systems. So both are necessary for success. So for, those, for the, the uh, delegates that already identified themselves as managers, and Richard, I'll call on you, because you, you, you're a manager, right? Or you raise your hand? Yeah, I would say well, many of those project managers. Okay. You would agree with this? Yeah. OK. That, OK. But, but you're always going to say you're busy, right? Yeah. OK. So, so you're, you're always busy. You know, work is fragmented because there are various things happening during out the day. The activities can be varied. And you're often given a lot of verbal direction. There was talk yesterday, I remember William was talking about 
communication, emails, being able to retrieve information, knowledge management, that, that is very useful. It's a useful tool, but during the workday, you're, you're giving verbal direction, which is why you need that structure to at least not necessarily record everything that you're saying, but at least provide direction based on you're following certain procedures, you're following certain techniques to, to get the work done. So, okay, communication means different things to different people. Uh, everyone took, or uh, hopefully everyone has, the, the sheet of paper. And if you don't, if, if you want to have that sheet of paper ready, because we're going to do a quick in-class exercise. So, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give direction on what to do with this sheet of paper. And uh, everyone in the back. And if, if you don't have a sheet of paper, that it's not a problem. This is just to, to demonstrate one item. But I'm going to give instructions. So follow the instructions, what, what you interpret that I'm saying. And I'm going to do the exact same thing, but you will not see my sheet of paper. And let's just see what we come up with. So, okay, so, so to begin, take your sheet of paper, okay, fold it in half. Fold it in half again. Tear off one corner. OK? OK, is everyone done? Oh, say it again. Uh, okay, you're supposed to take take the sheet of paper, okay, fold it in half, fold it in half again, then tear off one corner of the piece of paper. Well, just one corner. Okay. Well, and th this is this is th this is how to demonstrate giving instructions. Okay, is everyone ready? Are you, are you done? Do you have your sheet of paper? Okay, what does yours look like? This is, this is mine, okay. Okay, you got hole in the center, hole in the center, hole in the center. Okay, mine two are up at the top. Okay, so you see how just giving basic instructions can be interpreted, oh, very good, I like that. <laughs> can be interpreted differently. So, which is why you need procedures, which is why you need consistent direction. So, very, very good. And, and that's the other thing. Uh, in, in math, there, there's the right answer. You're looking for the number. When it comes to management, human resources, there's not often a, a, a correct answer, uh, as we see here. I mean, we, we all know what we need to do, but it can be interpreted differently. So, very good. All right. Okay. The, oh, <laughs> well. So, so as the department manager, I have to improve that. So, so I, I will issue a procedure next time. So, with with, with drawings, I mean that would even help uh, even further. So, whoops. Okay. So, getting back to the slides, managing versus leading. Uh, two different uh, concepts, and, and as I just touched on earlier, management is really about coping with, with the work process and the complexity, uh, the here and now, practices and procedures, uh, order and consistency. That, so that's, that's the classic management model. Leadership, change, it's coping with change, and the thing that I discovered in being a manager is listen first, like receiving feedback uh, regarding the instructions were uh, clear, uh, and it goes back to my quote here is what we are doing, managing, versus where we are going, leading. So here are some examples. Planning and budgeting versus setting direction. We talk about the, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three of constructing a nuclear power plant. Management function, the predictability and orderly results. Uh, the, but the leadership is to produce change. It's, I would focus on the lead, where leadership comes into uh, critical in this process is that transition 
going from phase one to phase two. Management can pretty much take care of what's going on within that phase. That's how I would look at it. Organizing and staffing versus uh, aligning people. The people and skills and the jobs, the plans are implemented, that's management. But then the leaders look for the people and the vision. Whereas you're in phase one, now, like we're in, call it the middle of phase one, but you know what? We have to start hiring for phase two. So they're actually looking out further ahead. So that's one example of the difference. Uh, controlling activities, uh, management, focusing on the complete routine jobs where this, the leaders, it's you know, attitude. And uh, David had uh, touched on that as well. So to summarize, management, you know, being the here and now, it's focused on more of the quantitative aspects. For leadership, it's focused on those qualitative aspects. It's thinking ahead and, uh, you know, what's coming up that you need to be prepared for. Okay, who follows the World Cup? Okay, any, anyone else? Is there any other sport that you follow? What? Rug oh, excellent, rugby. I, I, yeah. I have a good friend of mine, he, he's a rugby player, and I don't tend to have very many disagreements with him. So, uh, but one of the, the examples here I'm using is in, in the uh, area of sports. I have coached my son in, in baseball, for example, and I, and I grew up playing uh, a variety of sports. And in creating leaders, there are two ways to approach this. One is that you have the coach, which is here, and they focus on the captain, and then the captain serves as this barrier between both he and the coach and the players. And it's not to treat the captain as the favorite. It's basically the captain is actually shielding the coach uh, from the players. And the advantages here is, as I show in the examples, it's the captain serves as this barrier, shield for the team, it forces the players to trust the captain and each other. So depending upon who might be further up from you, if, if they're a difficult manager, a difficult boss, but no matter what's going on with that, are you shielding your employees so that way they can do their job effectively? And that's just one of the aspects of being a department manager. So in the sporting event, the captain serves as a de facto coach during the game. Uh, in some basketball games that uh, I've watched, especially in the championships, you'll see, and this is at the college level, you'll see the, the players like gather, like the game is going on, they'll have a timeout, but the players gather by themselves. The, the coach, you know, he's just standing on the sideline like this, not, not really involved, not giving direction, but the coach uh, or the, the captain, the captain, uh, of that team, they're, they're working out their strategy. That, that's what you eventually want to get to, is that your team works independently, and, and not to say that the manager is no longer needed, but basically that's the ultimate goal, or that, that's this, this qualitative aspect. Uh, you can't really put a number on it, but that's what you're trying uh, to get to. So the players are less dependent on the coach in a crisis situation, and that usually goes back to what I call a championship team. What I've discovered uh, in my entire uh, life of playing sport, I've been on two championship teams, and one of the attributes of that team was that we had a strong bench, which means if the, if the starter was injured or not able to play, call it the second string, you know, came in and was just as good, just as effective, and for the most part, that, um, that person did not mind being second string. So it was that team mentality. I've also been on a, a sports team where we had zero wins and 14 losses. And basically, it was like we were just there to have fun, not take it seriously. When the game was over, we all pretty much left and went our own separate ways. So, but, so there is a, a distinction. And, and once again, it's not something you can really say, well, that, that's, a, that's a four, that's a seven. Like, you can't really assign a number to it, but it's something that, that uh, you begin to see. Now, the other aspect, uh, the coach, this is what I call a player's coach, and this can be just as effective. It just depends on the environment that you're in, where the coach is really the center, and it's focused on all the players. 
Uh, the players trust the coach, the captain and players. But, but one of the downsides is that the captain and players may become too dependent on the coach. Uh, and this is where your assistant coaches monitor the players just to make sure that everyone is treated fairly in, in this situation. Because if the coach is always going after the captain, well, you know who the, the, the target is. But in this case, there could be a little bit of favoritism that may come out. So this is a little bit more difficult uh, to monitor. But necessarily, as I say here, both cases, a strong bench determines the championship. And your program, it has a three-year longevity. That's the other thing that, I, that I've discovered in my career. It seems like you can hold things together for about three years. And then after those three years, that's when you, you tend to have people leave to seek other advancement, maybe retirements, new people coming into the group, which is which also affects the dynamic of the organization because now they have to be trained and get up to speed with the program. So, but there's usually about a three-year point of consistency that, that I've just experienced uh, in my career. So your department, uh, you're maintaining oversight of the program. Your direct reports, as shown in this sports model, you have, uh, they're implementing the program. You have the tools or the procedures. Uh, and you've delegated your authority, your direct reports use these tools to perform the scope of work. But now, here's the other key element. And, and what hopefully this was shown in these sports models is you're delegating this information, like just like we went through the paper exercise. I was delegating instructions, and everyone had a different way of interpreting how to uh, tear the piece of paper. So delegation becomes, as the manager, delegation. It's the sharing of authority. I'm not just uh, you know, giving away all my responsibility. I'm still responsible as the department manager. So before you delegate, uh, you must communicate. And there are three degrees of delegation that you'll also see. This, this may be an important slide to remember. Uh, I guess there's a quiz or a test that you have to take. So, um, so anyways, uh, but there are three ways of looking at delegation, low, moderate, and high. And this is based on level or uh, amount of experience. If someone is brand new to the organization, they may have a low degree of delegation where there's that constant routine communication that takes place. Moderate, where uh, the uh, investigate and advise on actions plan, the supervisor approves or disapproves based on information provided by the employee. So there's a little bit uh, better or more of an exchange of information going on. And then high, this is where the employee goes out, takes care of it, and says, it's solved. We did, like, like what I'm going to hear tonight, my, my group has a high degree of delegation because they're going to tell me we have the root cause done, the PowerPoint is done, which, which it was. I mean, it was about 90% complete. So, so anyways, my group has this high degree of, of delegation. So, so you are managing strategy, not effort. So turning the ideas into performance, how do we, uh, the numbers are still a part of this. What people are going to look for uh, are the numbers. Uh, and this is where you get into, for example, in the industrial safety world, the number of accidents. You've accumulated so many safe work hours. Uh, are there any uh, you know, open corrective actions? How long do they stay uh, open? And then uh, kind of quoting Gandhi here, I, I like this quote from his, but then what I've also experienced from my own uh, time in the workforce, if you are doing things correctly, the numbers take care of themselves often. Some companies will manage to the numbers, like we have to get this certain number done by the end of this month. If your program is in place, if everything is operating correctly, the numbers will, will just happen. And I saw this firsthand uh, when we accumulated this amount of safe work hours. We had our program in place. We were interacting with the employees in the field. And fortunately, it was just one, what I call, it was a magical time where everything worked. And it, it was. It, uh, this is a project I was on from 2000 to 2006, and it, it, it was one of the best projects that I've ever been on, just because it was one of those times where every, everything worked, and uh, we had good numbers, everyone had a good attitude. And, and in this case, this was six years where we had uh, a, a stable workforce. We didn't lose too many people. We still had some people come in, but I can say the employees that did leave, these were employees that reported to me that were going on and uh, going off and uh, managing their own program. So once again, I, I wasn't about to hold them back. If they, if they were seeking a, a good professional opportunity, 
Uh, I, in fact, I encourage them to do that. Uh, and, I'll, and on the flip side, there's nothing wrong with an employee who, who is in the area, they live there, they want to finish their career at this particular plant. That is just as important. So the metrics, uh, we talked about quantitative, this is qualitative, the self-assessments, the real, what I call the real reason for management, and this is where you're going out and assessing your programs. Uh, does a safety culture and questioning attitude is, exist among employees? These are various programmatic aspects. Uh, in one of the handouts, there's, uh, I provided an activity hazard review, so you feel free to use that uh, in your line of work. Uh, typical field level activities that, that are more qualitative, uh, that are effective, pre-job and post-job briefings, daily closeout meetings, and STOP work suggestions. Uh, STOP is just an acronym for, um, and I can't recall it right now, but it had to do with like a safety program. So it's like stopping work in case if there's like a deviation uh, from the normal, normal process, and that's where QA comes in. So very good. Oh, this is the example of the uh, analyzing the hazards. Uh, this will be in your handouts. And just to give you an example here, physical hazards, known, suspect, not applicable, cold stress, heat stress, noise, slips, trips, and falls. So for those of you that are working in an industrial environment or maybe overseeing a project, like if you're considering new construction, if things start happening in the field, this can be a form that you can use. So th this uh, should be available. And it's uh, even though we published this back at a conference back in 2003, it it's still effective uh, today. So success stories, uh, one of the things that, uh, that, from my own experience, again, what I have found very useful in dealing with uh, field operations, because that's really where I, I developed my managerial skills, was working in the field, was every morning, uh, plan of the day, and even for off hours or off shift hours, I was on certain projects where we were working 12 hour shifts from uh, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. We would work four days, take a few days off, and then we do 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So we were on a rotating shift basis, but, but we still had the same uh, employees. So we were still, the, the team was kept together. But one of the things that we would do is cover safety topic, weather, and the sports scores for the local teams. And this is one way to make sure that you're getting feedback with the activities in the field, discuss project details, metrics, trends, the various project elements. And then not necessarily at night, because HR would work like 8 to 5 PM. But uh, uh, during the day shift, uh, we would have other departments come in and talk. So that way, the employees even knew we did have a QA department. We did have a human resources department. So that, so that was always useful. Uh, weekly, we would cover a different topic. Uh, so, and feel free to use this or, or modify it for your purposes. Uh, we would just try to, every day of the week, we would just try and provide some different information because if you're covering safety Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it can, pretty soon people start to tune out. It just gets to become mundane, routine. Uh, whereas if you have something different, but even following this consistent schedule, it keeps the employees aware as to what's going on with the project, and plus it's a different topic. So things do not get stagnant or, or boring. And we always try to say, you know, we'll ramp up Monday, and we'll start to wind down on Friday. So oh, one year ago today, uh, and this was a, a gentleman that I worked for. He played college football. And one of the things that, that he said to us when this project was starting is that he said, we are going to be a different team. Or actually, let me even start over again. This was, he played college football. This was a coach, his coach, that said to him, we are going to be a different team at the end of the football season than, than what we are now. Okay, and, but, and that approach was the team was going to evolve. They were going to hopefully get better through practice, you know, a little bit improvements of practice throughout the year. So by the end of the season, the team should be working together. The other thing that, that also I want to get across is this time perspective. It, it sounds like many of these things can, can, you know, within one week, you know, you put a program together. It does take a little bit longer. It'll take about 
six months to, to really get everything together, get everything going. So uh, it's just like when we, uh, last week, uh, Dr. Martinique, who gave the presentation on emergency management, uh, depending upon, I don't know if he had talked about preparing for drills. For us, we would spend about six months preparing for a, a major exercise. And, and this is not just something like a, a, a building that had a radioactive or chemical release. This is where you have multiple events going on. You're involving off-site agencies. You're involving a, a lot of people. So, so keep in mind, something like that can take six months. The IAEA conducts, conducts these multi-state uh, emergency actions, correct? The, uh, I can't think of the, the name, but the, it was supposed to be in Hungary coming up. I don't know if they did it this year or maybe they bumped it to 2018. Oh, they already done it. And, and, and it takes like, what, two years, it seems like, to, to coordinate that. So depending upon the scale of the project, you know, that, that's, that, that's the time. But to get to your question, <laughs> the ramp or the one year ago today, as you, if your project has already been operating for quite some time, it's always good to, to look back and say, what were we doing one year ago? Like, like, we, like uh, maybe the containment building wasn't built yet. A year ago, the containment building is built. Now we're, now we're training for the procedures. So, so as you're moving forward, you're always looking back to say, what were we doing a year ago? Just to maintain that perspective that you are moving forward, you are advancing, you, you are improving. So that, that's where that comes from. So uh, leadership and career advice, as we start to uh, wrap things up, uh, good performance. It's still the basic foundation of success, showing up, doing your job. Uh, how you communicate uh, will influence your upward mobility. And the, the paper exercise, for example, be active in decision-making events. Uh, such as you know, key decisions like we should uh, pursue shipping waste off-site to this particular vendor and here are the reasons why. Uh, become a complementary employee by having different skill sets than your managers. Typically, you may have a department where you'll have electrical, mechanical, uh, process engineering. So that, that's always good. And one of the things that I found very useful, and even if this is in uh, professional society publications, if you can, publish your work. Because one of the things, as a manager, and if we're hiring employees, you'll get 30 resumes. And they all tend to start to look the same after a while. But if you publish your work, at least that documents, you were there. And, and this is one of the things that I had done throughout my career. So uh, as, as we move forward beyond this class, if you have any questions, the last slide has my email address. So feel free to email me if you have any other questions, because chances are um, I, I currently write for uh, Power Magazine. I do freelance writing for them. So I've written on a variety of topics in commercial nuclear. So if you have any specific questions, chances are I can, I can send you a, the link uh, to the article, because most of this is on the web. Or like the uh, activity has the review sheet. You know, We did that back in 2003. Uh, but that documents what we did on that project back then. But the other thing to keep in mind is, as a manager, you're always you know, evaluating yourself. Do you want five things half done or 10 things half done? You, you're, if something is like 80% complete, my recommendation is finish it. And then you can move on to the next you know, thing that, that you have to get done. Because often, as Richard, with the uh, with, with you know, being very busy, do you find yourself you have a lot of things half done? Yeah. So, so that that's why it's like, do you want five things half done or ten things half done? So, so that's where, and often it, w when you're talking to your employees, ask them like, how close are you in getting this done? And if they say, well, I just got to spend one more day on this, I'll tell them, okay, lock yourself in your office, finish it, get it done, and then we'll move on to the next item. So practical career advice, do not expect your responsibilities to be defined by narrow job descriptions. Because once again, uh, the, the hiring process, uh, it has specific criteria. But as you move throughout your career, as you move in this job uh, or your assignment, uh, you may take on other responsibilities. And what I, what I always try to do, if ever I'm starting a, a new position, 
uh, I always try to do this assignment project completion list during the first six months. And then I compare it to my job description because depending upon if you have some form of employee evaluation process, you can tell your employer, well, I was hired to do this, but based on the situation, I started doing this. So once again, it's a way to document if there's any deviation from what you were hired to do. And establish cooperation with other departments, QA, human resources, records management, th those are uh, very valuable to have. So either looking up or down the career ladder, uh, your career is often determined by the competency of your immediate supervisor. Uh, just like in my situation, I had direct reports reporting to me just because 10 people left to manage their own programs. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm a great manager, but it, it's, you know, you're encouraging your workforce uh, to improve. Communication skills eventually start to overshadow technical skills, and your direct reports are looking to you to advance their careers. And uh, my other quote here that I've used, and actually my son picked up on this, your direct reports will not really accept you until they have a reason to. So realizing your strengths and weaknesses, in this course, we covered a lot of material. So if there's one particular area throughout these last two weeks, uh, you know, focus in on that because you know, obviously the nuclear industry covers a variety of materials. But uh, I use this example uh, based on, uh, well, my wife, she plays the piano, so she has educated me on uh, various uh, uh, concert pianists. Uh, this particular one, Van Cliburn, I, I don't know if anyone is familiar with Van Cliburn. No? Chopin? Yeah, okay, I'm, okay like I'm seeing heads nod, so, so Chopin a little bit more. But anyways, uh, he became famous in 1958 because at the age of 23, he won this major piano competition in Russia. He was the first American uh, to do this, uh, the Tchaikovsky Piano Competition uh, in Moscow. And his mother actually studied under uh, uh, another uh, famous uh, piano composer. But then a schoolmate of his is John Williams. Uh, they were both at Juilliard, which is a, a major school for uh, music. And John Williams has done very well in his career. He, is, uh, he has written numerous scores for movies. But the point here is he was able to see way back when, well, if that's the competition, I think I'd better be a composer. So that's the one thing within your group. If, you're, if there's like 10 electrical engineers, it's like, well, see how your, if you have a certain specialty, see how yours may be a little bit different, or do you want to start training in another discipline to complement your, your electrical engineering skills? So that's uh, one option. So this is just a, an example. Uh, the last slide, these are just the, the various handouts uh, that uh, you can also download from the presentations, getting good information from others, uh, man, uh, evaluating your managerial strengths and weaknesses. Uh, this is just for your own uh, evaluation, as it shows here, if you get a score from eight to nine, this would be a strength uh, where you can mentor others. If you get a five to seven, target for growth. But if you get a zero to four, that doesn't mean uh, it's not bad, it's just that you, this is like an area that you can improve through professional development. Uh, integrated safety management system wheel. We talked about various programs coming together. That's available. We got the hazard review form. Uh, we had a slide on that. And then outside the corner office, uh, this is just an article I wrote uh, a number of years ago, and it talks about uh, promotions. Should promotions be based on past accomplishments, or is it the ability to grow into that position? So, uh, so wrapping up, learning objectives. Recognizing the need for a class. Management has been studied for a number of years, but there, uh, once again, it depends on the organization. If there is some form of succession planning or training, if there is no training, you're left up to yourself, and hopefully this training class has provided some value to you. Uh, the study of management, it's been done for a number of years. When you are finally in charge, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the, the four questions, we covered the sports uh, analogy, uh, team captains, ideas into performance, that's the numbers, the qualitative and quantitative assessments, uh, the career advice, which I've provided, 
And then we also covered the additional handouts and slides. So the star of success, I have this in my office. So this is like one slide just to kind of keep things in perspective. Uh, I use this slide because it kind of gives an overall wrap up. So, if, so as a department manager, as you go into this role, feel free to print this out and keep it in your office, hang it on the wall to always keep that perspective. And then terminal objective, uh, the purpose of this was to prepare you uh, to make that transition from being a, a subject matter expert to a manager. And then uh, one of my favorite quotes from Luis Pasteur, in the fields of observation, chance favors the prepared mind. So by taking this training, you have improved your chances. You have prepared yourself to uh, step into that role as a manager uh, should that opportunity arise. So uh, last but not least, contact information. As time moves on after this course, if any questions come up, uh, either feel free to contact me, David, uh, Ashok, and if you have any other questions, and we'll be sure to help you out. And then uh, the la this additional slides, uh, this was the power article that I wrote that appeared in, in the June 1st issue. The link is available in the handout, or you can just Google Power Mag, my last name, Hilco, and, and safety culture, and it'll pull up the article. But that graph that I use that talks about the organizational uh, culture and climate, uh, the article goes into a little bit more detail on that. So feel free to reference that if you want. But that uh, concludes the presentation. Hopefully you have found this uh, information very useful, and I look forward to hearing from you in the future. So thank you.